My name is Elena, and you're listening to Harlequin Homo, a show where a local lesbian discusses and rates romance novels. Today, I'll be discussing the romance novel Pestilence by Laura Thalassa with my friend and guest this week, Wendy. Before we get to today's episode, I want to put out a content warning. Today's episode contains discussions of violent and abusive relationships. If you or anyone you know is struggling, please call the National Domestic Violence Hotline at one 800 799 7233 or visit their website at thehotline.org. So, Wendy, I would like to tell you the journey real quick of how this book titled Pestilence Mm. came into my life. The book cover is a very blonde man who is very shirtless. The pants go very low. Golden armor. I saw this book at Barnes and Nobles and just bought it without reading anything about it. I want to take us to Canada. Okay. Modern times. Okay. There's a girl named Sarah. With or without the H. Without the H. Okay. Thank you for asking. Um, Sarah is a literary genius, but before she could go get her doctorate in literature, four horsemen entered the world, and the world ended. Oh, no. Oh, yeah. Oh, no, no. Okay. <laughs> so Sarah, well, who should have gone to college, this is talked about many times, mm-hmm. instead became a firefighter. Natural progression. Yeah. Sure. The people within this small Canadian town decide that nowhere else they have tried to kill pestilence, so they're going to do it. Four firemen remaining, and Sarah, draw straws. Sarah ends up with a short straw. (gasps) What? Yeah. That's a shocking twist. It's a shocking twist. So Sarah tries to kill pestilence. As you do. He's mad because he does not die. Fair. So he decides he's going to kidnap her and take her with him. And her form of torture will be watching him make everyone in the world fall ill with a very, very deadly virus. Oh. And then she falls in love with him. And then... (laughs) I feel like we're skipping a bit. (laughs) Oh no, it's literally while he's making people die, she falls in love with him because she finds out he doesn't want, he doesn't like this. He doesn't like that this is who he is. Even though he tells her he has a choice to not do it. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Some point, they start banging. And then after that a little bit, she basically is like, you can make a choice because we're banging now and he's like you're right I think we can live together and then he stops making people sick after the book mentions he murders millions of people across the globe wipes out Ontario in its entirety Mm -hmm. um but he's protective of her so she finds that redeeming and then the book ends and you find out they've had kids together and that's this book Immediate thought. Yeah. Obviously, she has at least four STIs, right? Probably. Because if you're banging pestilence, yeah. I feel like you're at least walking away with one or more trips to the women's yeah. clinic. Yeah, 100%. Yikers. So here, here is where this book struck me as odd. Because it was in the romance section at Barnes & Nobles. That's all you So need. that's all I need. Yeah. So I know this is supposed to be a romance book. And you book. looked at the cover. And I looked at the cover. It's obviously a romance novel. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So what really struck me as odd was that in this first chapter of this novel, she murders the man who she is going to eventually fall in love with. The book describes in great detail she shoots off half of his face and then she burns him while he's still conscious. This is the first chapter? This is the first chapter. So, okay, so we just dive straight we into dive short straight straw. Into, yeah, she's, she is like there ready to kill him. Why is it the firefighters? I don't, it doesn't really explain. It's okay. just they were the last ones there. They decided that they were going to do it. But, like, only one of them. Okay. Because they assumed the one of them would die if they failed, and then the rest of them were, like, off hiding. I, I'm not gonna... Yeah. I'm not gonna backseat drive their plan here, I but I see some of the flaws. Yeah. All right. Yeah, I definitely had a moment. Okay, and so she, she shoots half of his face off. It describes, like, his nose is missing, and then she, she notices he's still breathing. He asks her, he begs her for mercy multiple times. She douses him in kerosene and lights him on fire. Which, at that point, I would also be a little upset. Like, I... If, yeah. Yeah. So, and then he, he brings up a really good point when he, you know, because he, like, heals very quickly. Uh, and he finds her, like, sleeping in a cabin and is like, I have, he, he literally has already wiped out, like, five or six towns at this point. Sure. And he's like, did you not think that other people tried to kill me? Which is just, I just want to know, you it's know? Like, did you not think of, did she think that she was going to be the one? 
And has she, like, like, I know she didn't go to college, and that's very important to the narrative. Yeah, absolutely. But one would think she would at least be vaguely familiar with dystopian future stories. Yeah. Apocalyptic right? tales. The need to really, really confirm the big baddie yeah. is dead uh-huh. before you go nap in a cabin in the woods by yourself in, I'm assuming, remote Canada? Yeah, this is, like, really remote. So this is an enemies to lovers. Mm. Which, personally, love the trope. I love it. Always fun. Usually contains some really sharp banter. Absolutely. Some good tension. 100%. Nice, like, yearning, but I hate yeah. that I'm yearning. Yeah. This sounds like she murdered him Mm -hmm. very violently in a pretty cruel way a horrible way to die like not not a mercy killing no that she went with and then he responds to that as one might imagine with a bit of vitriol but definitely dials it up to 11 what with the mass murder of millions of people yeah and forcing her to watch. So, honestly, through this, I'm a bit concerned about her. Yeah. So, that that just kind of brings me to... I want to read you a, a little bit. This is chapter six. The chapters are very short. So, here's the thing. When he first kidnaps her, he decides that she will not be riding on the horse with him. Um, so they have literal horses. They have literal... So he has a horse. Okay. But right now he's pretty mad because she burned him alive. Yeah. You know, and As I would... You do. Yeah. It makes me cranky. We get to this really awesome point where he has tied her to his horse and is making her run behind him. An excerpt from Pestilence by Laura Thalassa. The horse jerks against my weight and I let out a scream as my arms are violently jerked nearly out of their sockets. The rope digs into the flesh of my wrists and I shriek again at the blinding pain. I have to lift my head as my body drags along behind the horse to prevent it from getting injured. Yesterday's snow has mostly melted away and the bare asphalt now acts like sandpaper against my back. I can almost feel the layers of my thick coat disintegrating under the force of it. Once it goes, I don't know how long a human can last like this. And then she doesn't get the chance to find out because he stops her. After dragging her a good distance like this. So there's something distinctly uncomfortable about the fact that she's using that she's using such very sexual language to describe violence. Yeah. And it, there's always that line mm-hmm. there and there are often ways to I think responsibly absolutely navigate that and recognize that there can be overlap, but it's not foreplay um torturing yeah someone like that's not a ooh i'm building tension well and i think it makes me so distinctly upset but also uncomfortable because i'm a i'm a big fan of katie roberts who has Mm -hmm. written electric idols and sabine valley is a series i'm reading right now but she writes a lot of bdsm Mm -hmm. and is so careful with how she writes it in a way that is so responsible it doesn't at any point get to a point where i'm uncomfortable as a reader so i think the idea that like yeah it's understandable that violence may move into sex yes but not in a way that i'm conditioning you yeah exactly it's built from consent Mm -hmm. from the start which is the critical piece of all things related to bdsm and what the community actually is about so this isn't that no this isn't like ooh. sometimes both parties find it a little fun to do some things that are painful or uncomfortable no, you are just torturing someone. Yeah. And eventually they love you for that. Both parties have done some things that are not great. But the thing that also bothers me is that within the novel, there are so many moments where she is watching him do horrible things. She's watching him torture her or she's like remarking on a situation that is just incredibly awful. And for some reason, it just feels the need to talk about how attractive he is. Like, it pulls away. Like, in these moments of really unhealthy, like, violence or tension, it just, like, feels the need to, like, clarify that he is being violent, but he's hot. Like, tell me that when he's making you an omelet aggressively. Right? Yeah. Like, tell me about his forearms and seeing the prominent veins in his forearms that comes up in every romance novel. Absolutely. Oh, oh, the forearms are a big thing. The forearms. 
everyone knows that's a label woman's heart. And multiple times throughout the novel, she he doesn't trust her to like do things alone. So he like watches her bathe and change and stuff, and she's like very excited by it. Like the thing is, I've read a lot of. This sounds awful. I've read a lot of stories where the female is kidnapped or is being, like, it just, it's, it's, its, own it's, a, trope. it's its own trope. Yeah. We don't have time to go into that. Yeah. But, like, a lot of novels, despite the fact that that is the trope, make sure to, like, emphasize the fact that, like, the person who is holding the female against her will is not doing anything to make her uncomfortable outside of holding her hostage, like, which sounds awful, but it's like, it's like, we're gonna cross this line, but we're not gonna cross that line. Right. And, and this one doesn't even bother to, like, try and save it a little bit. It's just, like, he just watches her change and bathe. And there are multiple times where, like, she will wake up in new clothes and is like, oh, he must have changed me. Uh, and it's like, no. um, mm-mm. No, like, mm-mm. That's not how you handle that. Notably after that scene where he's dragged her in the asphalt, she has, like, horrible wounds on her back. And she <laughs> passes out. And then she wakes up and has been completely stripped and gauzed. Ah, uh, yes. That's how I fall in love with a man. You put a band-aid on me after giving me road rash from dragging me behind your horse. And it's not even mm. the physical. Like, the physical violence is also bad. That's not, like, a justifier moment. But then later in the book, there are two very prominent moments where they stay with... The first is they stay with a family. The second is they stay with an elderly couple. The family is a little bit more rough because they have two young kids. Ugh. And he mm -hmm. insists that they stay with them, despite the fact that everywhere he goes, if people catch sight of him, they immediately fall ill with this plague. And it's described as being really gruesome with boils and fevers, and then, like the boils open up and it's like pussy, and then they die in great pain. So he then decides that physical torture maybe isn't doing exactly what he wants it to do for her. Right. So he decides that he is going to make her stay with this family while they are dying and makes her tend to these two kids and their parents. And it describes in great detail these kids getting sick, the parents watching their children die, and it's just, it is an incredibly awful, horrible moment, and then it's never talked about again. So there is certainly a market for torture porn. Uh, I feel like this was given the wrong cover and put in the wrong area. And yeah. maybe Barnes & Noble, not the right call to carry this. Someone is getting off on the absolute cruelty and finding the thing that is most hideous and most repulsive and that will elicit the like strongest emotional response. I mean, unless they kill the horse. Obviously, if they kill the horse, people would have an even stronger reaction. The horse comes back to life, actually. The horse is killed, but then it's brought back okay, to life. So, so no, they hit all they the hit tech all marks. of them. Children, yeah. sweet elderly couple, mm -hmm. abuse of an animal. Yeah. The elderly couple is very nice to him, by the way. It's very nice to Pestilence. And he, he feels great remorse about the fact that even though he could choose not to, he does kill them. Because you find out, because at the end of the novel, you find out that he can just decide not to. And then because of her love, he heals everyone that is currently sick. But not the but ones, not that, the are ones that are dead. dead. Yeah, the millions of, like, he's wiped mm -hmm. out Los Angeles. He's wiped out, like, the entire West Coast of the United States and is making his way, like, around. So he is already, like, the West Coast is gone. Oh, Lord. Yeah. Is this a four-part series? It is. Of course. Yeah, so, because, you know, this is only the, four, the first Horseman. I will not be reading the other three. Really? That is truly shocking to me. I know. I... Honestly, this book upset me so much. And you powered through to the end. And I well, I think I powered through to the end because I had this moment of, like, weird hope that maybe he would die. <laughs> like, and, like, it would be I redeemed in that this way. romance novel with the greatest hope that the main character would die. At that point, it got, I was just like, yeah, I'm gonna, maybe this will get better. And then it did not. Part of this book shocked me because I'm, I'm used to reading romance novels that are bad. And I'm used to stopping in the middle of a book because it, it's just bad. Like, it's just not even worth finishing. Mm -hmm. What was different is this book made me so uniquely uncomfortable and upset in a way that I have not been made upset from other romance novels. Mm -hmm. Like, there are there are moments in books where I'm like, that was sexist or that wasn't great. Cringing. Cringing, yeah. There are things yeah. you cringe over. There are things you're like... 
I'm just going to pretend that I didn't read that part right? and keep on going. But this, no matter what I did, even with that hope, it just kept getting worse. And even the parts where we're supposed to be seeing character development from him and acceptance and love and it just was all drowned out by the fact that I knew that all of this horrible stuff had happened and was still happening. It's it's not another trope being, you know, morally gray. Mm -hmm. The male protagonist in particular, like morally gray love interests. We love that, especially in an enemies to lovers story. Oh, absolutely. Yes, give me a guy that is problematic. But that's the key thing. It, he's problematic, but he's not irredeemable. Mass murder is pretty irredeemable. The whole like character arc is that he thought mankind was irredeemable. The point is that she is supposed to show him with her love that mankind is not irredeemable. Okay, the thing that worked about Beauty and the Beast is that he was a spoiled brat who was throwing tantrum. Not that he was intentionally wiping out large swaths of people and torturing Belle for funsies. I, I see you trying to live in that space, author. Um, but that's not, that's not how you do that. No. And it's not fun or just like, ooh, I'm taking this to an edgier place. No. No, no you're taking it to an irresponsible place. And I, because I can even get behind the idea of he can't control it. Sure. And her love for him and forgiveness of him, some... Yeah, if, if he can't Warm control being, it... That changes yeah. his power that now he is able to control it? Amazing. Okay, that's better. Yeah. Uh, it's a manslaughter. It's still, yeah, manslaughter. Now. You know, um, but... I guess. It's still easier to stomach than he could stop it. He could at any moment decide not to and just chooses not to. Like, mm -hmm. the, the book makes that abundantly clear that he has so much free will in this and just chooses not to until the literal last moment. Like, who is this audience? Who were you writing for? <sighs> is it is it someone who's going to get off on this? Because that's... Lord knows they're, they're going to sure. need some therapy. Or is it... Ugh, someone who's more vulnerable to this message? Because I don't like that either. And I think that's my fear is, like, I understand, I guess, if you absolutely feel the need to write some form of this plot, but you, <laughs> but maybe don't do it in a way that promotes violence. There is so much violence in this couple mm -hmm. together. Mm -hmm. And that's not a good message for anyone, that it's okay if you physically harm your partner oh, it, on either side. And when was this published? So this book was published... It was, 2018. Okay, because here's the thing. We also are living in a post-pandemic world. Not that it's over. But we, as a readership, as a world, just watched countless people die from a plague. Yeah. And I think it's absolutely going to read very different to a 2022 reader versus a 2018-19 reader. Absolutely. So looking at it through the lens that we have to look at now, we literally just saw this happen in real life. So the idea of making it okay that she, Sarah, without the H, became desensitized to watching this mass horrifying death, that's not okay either. No. Because while it, to a certain extent, is what happened, and at a certain point, you know, the, the death toll that came from this event became numbers that were so high they became almost unfathomable to actually internalize. Yeah. But to pretend like, no, it's good that you watched all this happen and you can still find love and forgiveness and bangability from the man who caused it all, that's not okay. And it also makes me think of the fact that in a post-pandemic world, we also know that during quarantine... Domestic violence calls were mm -hmm. up. There was a lot of issues with people being trapped in situations that they may not have been trapped in otherwise because of lockdowns and quarantine and everything. Absolutely. So now looking at it through that lens and understanding that, like, there are multiple parts of this. I want to be really clear. This book 
was wrong before the COVID <laughs> pandemic. Correct. But Correct. it's it's extra wrong now. Yeah. And it's just so baffling to me that, and it feels almost irresponsible to mm-hmm. write a book like this that desensitizes violence overall and desensitizes any kind of abuse because it is very truthfully an abusive relationship in every aspect from yes. from both parties. Yes. Like there is nothing about this that is like one side was just super innocent. It's a really abusive relationship. Yeah. And it makes it seem like that's okay as long as at the end of the day everyone's really sorry. And even then, are they like are they that sorry? Because it it I don't know how you prove you're that sorry, but I don't think what one would expect. Like, if you're really, really sorry and you truly understood the damage you caused, I don't think you should be able to live with yourself. Not like this. And not in a way that's like, well, I can ride off into the sunset and I'm okay because, gosh golly, I feel so bad. <sighs> And maybe it's just me, but the idea of being with someone who made me watch children die in front of me, that, for, like, that is just so horrible. Like, I can't even imagine, like, I, I can't even, like, Mm-mm. think about it, but it's just so crazy that, that this author felt like that was something that we could just get past. Yeah, because at the end of the day, you don't write a romance novel in the way that you would write other fiction where you can loathe the protagonist of the story or you can have very bad people that you still want to succeed even though you know they're very bad people. Yeah. That's not how romance novels work. No, you need to like both of them at least a little bit in order to find any happiness in the ending And I didn't like either of them (laughs) at all. And I think, honestly, part of the reason why I hated Sarah so much by the end was because, like, yeah, she murdered someone. Not great. She didn't succeed. She didn't succeed. And, like, in this, it was was easier for me to grasp at the beginning of the novel because I felt like, oh, okay, pretending this isn't a romance novel in an apocalyptic era... I understand the motive. In a in a dystopian novel, this makes sense. Sure. It does not make sense if this is a romance novel and you are going to be banging this person in 10 chapters. Which takes about 14 pages. Yeah. Judging by the way this plot progresses. You know, a standard size. What, yeah. That's 350 pages. Yeah. So hate that I can eyeball that, but... I'm really impressed. Okay. So that's a pretty standard length. You don't really have to dive straight into the murder. No. Um, but but torture, she but did. Thanks for doing that. And one would assume if you're going to do that, you might take more time to find a way to justify the behaviors. No, you didn't do that. You didn't do that. And I think it's hard because there are moments of like... Because Sarah is the narrator and there are moments through her eyes where she's like, well, he's an, he's another worldly being. He's closer to a god. He doesn't understand human behavior so and almost like like while he's doing horrible things and that still doesn't cut it for me was she inspired by nexium maybe i mean that that was also hitting at the same time that this was written i mean that's what it feels like it really does it feels like the inner monologue of the type of woman who falls in love with a serial killer and writes them letters and marries them and has their babies in prison and i think that's it's just so upsetting to me i've said that a lot because this book was really upsetting in a way i wasn't expecting it to be (laughs) (laughs) i just did it for the I just, I saw a shirtless guy on the cover and I was like, amazing. And <laughs> this then, will be a journey. This is going to be so exciting. And then I was so sad by the time I finished this book. Like, I was, I, I vented on Goodreads and that still wasn't enough. So I had to do a <laughs> whole thing about it. But I think just looking at it, like, I, I think also it's frustrating for me because I have women in my life who have experienced violence in relationships. Mm -hmm. And hearing from them, like, how hard it was to leave those relationships Mm -hmm. and that toxic behavior. But to a certain extent, it was really hard to leave because a lot of behavior has just been normalized in relationships. Like, in toxic relationships, regardless of who's the abusive one, like, to a certain extent, we just kind of accept it. 
and we promote certain aspects of toxic relationships, like they're not super problematic. So just reading this was so jarring because this is not the kind of behavior we should be promoting like as women or as anyone like no and it's something that most of the time most of your female protagonists in these stories are the ones that are calling out that behavior are shining a light on and even though they lean sometimes into the like pick me girl space it's the person who's saying, no, I'm different. I'm not like those other girls because I see this behavior is wrong. Like, we love us a rebel. We, we love our Lin- Lizzie Bennet. Are they annoying in real life? Absolutely. Yes. But in the novel, it's really important. And it's important because that is a huge part of Pride and Prejudice is that we understand that Darcy is a socially awkward human being and that he has faults and Lizzie has faults and they at a moment come together and realize that they're both flawed human beings who have maybe not like done what was the best choice in any given situation but then there's like a forgiveness and a moving on together Mm -hmm. and in a way that just is not happening in this novel because there's no redemption really at all. And really I mean Pride and Prejudice is the one we hold up. That is our enemies to lovers template. Yeah. That, that is kind of what everything else builds off of in some respect. Because it is such an influential book to the romance book community. Absolutely. Even those who don't love it are still like, yeah. Yeah, it's... It, it holds its weight. That's just not my trope. It's, he apologizes. That's such a huge moment. And, and changes in demonstrable ways that benefits her without benefiting himself. Exactly. And he didn't, like murder all of Devonshire. No, he so did that's not. a big plus. It's such a big deal that he didn't murder like, a lot of people. Wipe out all of Ireland. One of my favorite enemies to lovers is, and I'm forgetting the name of the Bridgerton book, but it's the second Bridgerton book. It's Antony and Kate's story. Yes. And it is such a wonderful, wonderful too. book. So I love yeah. it. But the book is is very different from the, the TV show, but it is such a great enemies to lovers and the author stays pretty true to like Regency era attitudes. So there are moments throughout that novel where, where Antony is misogynistic and it's a big deal because Kate in the book is like, that's not gonna work. And that's like a big deal is that mm-hmm. regardless of the fact that it's a book that's held in the Regency era, we're not just like accepting that he can be misogynistic and force her to do anything he wants because he's her husband now. And that's like a big deal. Yeah. And like there are ways to do this trope. There are ways to have your male character be problematic. There are ways to have your female character be problematic. Mm-hmm. And then work it out. They don't work it out. No. There's no working out. No. And it's it seems to glorify, in a way, this awful violence. Both domestic and external violence. Yeah. It's a, it's a really violent book. And this is just American desensitized to violence. But, like, that kind of violence isn't shocking to me on its own. Sure. Because... You went to public school. I went to public school. <laughs> I've read dystopian novels, I've read The Walking Dead comic books, like, I have seen and read some gross stuff. Yeah. But the violence is never tied into the romance and the, like, erotic nature of Mm -hmm. this coupling, and it bothers me so much because there is so many parts of this book where the violence leads into them banging, and it just is so awful or they're banging in a house where an elderly couple is dying and has boils on their skin oh that's so gross it's really gross no. yeah Ugh. yeah Ugh. this idea of like violence being perpetuated isn't like a rare thing no. um like not at all according to the national network to end domestic violence and this is like a statistic i've seen a lot but More than one in four women have experienced rape, physical violence, and or stalking by an intimate partner in their lifetime. Yeah. To be really clear, that's by an intimate partner. That's not, like, this isn't statistics of people from random attacks. These are partners. These are romantic Mm -hmm. or sexual partners that are inflicting this violence. And that statistic is probably low based on the fact that how many women have not reported it. Right. Hmm. So... At least. At least. At least one in four women. At least one in four women. 
And I think it's just really upsetting because I don't, I want to be really clear, I am not saying that Laura, the author of this novel, oh, can't Laura. write whatever she wants. Like, I don't believe in censorship. I'm not saying that this book shouldn't have been published. I think I'm more, I would more like to appeal to the idea that if you really feel the need to write a book like this, think about it in a responsible way mm -hmm. and think about the fact that like, wow, it is just a book. You still have an effect. You still have, people are still going to read this novel mm -hmm. and it's the Twilight phenomenon. When I was 14 and reading New Moon, I thought that Edward's super possessive behavior of Bella was really attractive. And I thought that was something I wanted in a partner. Right. And as an adult, I'm looking back at that and that's horrifying. Yeah. This is my fear is if I had picked up this novel at 13, 14, read it, I would have been like, oh, maybe this is romantic. Maybe mm -hmm. this is okay. And then God forbid someone entered into my life that was showing similar traits. I have just read a book that tells me it's absolutely okay mm -hmm. for my partner to be violent against me but as long as we like make amends at the end that's fine and no no it's absolutely no, not to okay be clear no that's it's not, not okay. okay that is absolutely unacceptable behavior and if you even want to throw a disclaimer on the front of your book of hey this is what this book contains and that's i mean that's the whole responsibility and publishing aspect too, because while I agree with you, I don't like censorship per se. It doesn't mean we can't be responsible with how we're labeling things how and we how we're talking. Yeah. And what we choose to publish. Absolutely. Because I think there is some degree of ownership and a responsibility of publishing to understand yeah. the impact of what they produce. Absolutely. And what is put out there. So, no, like if you are going to eroticize, I don't know if that's a word. I'm using it as well. Yeah, absolutely. Though. If you're going to eroticize violent language and specifically cruel torture in a non-consensual context, yeah. yeah, you have to take accountability for that. And that's not okay. Like, you know that language has power. You're a writer. You're a publishing house. Maybe think about how you can be a positive force yeah on the world instead of and like i understand not every story needs to be told no it Something really doesn't just stay in your little wattpad or right? there scribble are... in your journal and then you keep it there who beta this right i want to know who was in her reading circle that went yeah no laura i love this this laura, is good time laura you have to publish this this is insane and i like i, be I bet she runs an mlm she probably does. She does. Oh, a hundred percent. So my rating system, yes, is bodices. So we have between one and five. How many bodices are being ripped? Um, Good system. I like it. Thank you. I I give pestilence one ripped bodice. Okay. Because of the horrible violence. Yep. The hilarity of this is that there is so much about this book that I just wanted to talk about because it was so bad that I didn't even get the chance to talk about how hilariously bad the prose is because she is trying to make her narrator super snarky in a way that just comes off like a 14 year old is trying to be snarky. I mean, you already established the, oh, she quotes Shakespeare and Edgar Allan Poe mm -hmm. from memory. Yeah. Clearly Try Hard is written all, all over it. it. I, I gotta give it at least one bodice. I think she's just loosely laced. That's fair. One loosely laced bodice. bodice. Yeah, I don't feel like it gets fully ripped. It can't. It's nothing it's, about this is... No, the, there's any hint of sexiness. Is destroyed by yeah. the awful... And, and I would like to clarify that like even the erotic moments weren't that well written. Yeah. That it could have like mm -mm. been fine as a standalone erotic scene. It was just all bad. No, she she's one of those that you read on book talk and mock the yeah. different terms she uses for genitalia, yeah. I assume. Thank you so much for discussing this hey, with me. I thank you for traumatizing me Absolutely. with the horror of this awful why is he even wearing gold armor? Oh that's that, a, that's a, in? that is so he it's his it's his golden armor. He wears it everywhere. There are several moments in which he has to he he can't find an undershirt and so he just wears the armor on his skin, but I imagine that would chafe really badly. Horribly. There's a reason it's designed to not be worn like that. Yeah, it's rough. Literally. You've been listening to Harlequin Homo. 
A huge thank you to Wendy for being my guest this week, and thank you for taking the time to listen in. Keep reading, and I'll see you next time.